Module 5. This is Trish Connor Cato. In this module, we're going to create model calculations using DAX. You'll be introduced to the world of DAX and its true power for enhancing a model. You'll learn about aggregations and the concepts of quick measures, measures, calculated tables, and calculated columns to solve calculation and data analysis problems. You'll also learn about time intelligence functions and key performance indicators. First, let's talk about what is DAX. DAX stands for Data Analysis Expressions and is the formula language used in Power BI. The structure is somewhat different than basic Excel functions as you'll learn in this module. DAX is a collection of functions, operators, and constants that can be used in a formula or expression to calculate and return one or more values. DAX context enables you to perform dynamic analysis in which the results of a formula can change to reflect the current row or cell selection and any related data. We'll be using the sample superstore and retail sales analysis desktop files in this module. Again, you can find the files in the video description and we started building the sample superstore desktop file in module two. We'll be starting with the sample superstore desktop file if you wanna get that open. This module has five lessons. We're gonna start by creating calculated tables. Then we'll create calculated columns. You'll learn about quick measures and measures and how to create them. Then we'll work with time intelligence functions and end up using key performance indicators. Let's get started. We're gonna start by using the distinct function in DAX to create a calculated table that will return one column of all of the distinct order IDs from the orders table. To do this, we're gonna to go to the modeling tab on the ribbon and in the calculations group, go ahead and click on new table. You'll see two changes on your screen. You have a formula bar that says one table equal. And over in your fields pane to the right, you have a new table called table right now. We're gonna name that table distinct orders count. So go ahead and double click the word table in the formula bar and we'll just type distinct order count. And we're gonna click after the equal sign to build our distinct DAX function. What we really want is a count of the distinct order IDs in the orders table. So distinct means here, the total number of different values, regardless how many times those values appear in the table. We're gonna start by beginning to type the function name distinct. It will come up on the list. I usually stop typing at this point. So I make sure I don't make a typo. I can double click distinct from the list, or if it's already highlighted like it is in my case, I'm gonna press the tab key on my keyboard to tab it in. So it gives me the distinct function and an open parenthesis. Right underneath your formula bar, in bold, it says column name or table expression. That is the only function argument for distinct. So we want it to be for the orders table and in particular, the order ID field. I'm gonna start typing orders as in the table name and you'll notice the orders table shows up on the list as well as every field within the orders table. When you see orders order ID, you can double click it, or you could go down and highlight it and tab it in. The syntax here is the name of the table, and then the column within that table is enclosed in square brackets. At this point, we can press enter, and it will perform the calculation and return our one column table. Since we're in report view, we're not gonna be able to see the data. So on your left side, go to your second view button 
which is data view. And you'll see your distinct order count table on the right side in the fields pane. When you click on it, you'll see that the table contains one column and it only contains the distinct order IDs. If you look all the way at the bottom of the screen in the status bar, it tells you there's 1,746 rows. So there is 1,746 distinct order IDs in the orders table. In your fields pane, click on the orders table and look at the status bar and you'll see that there's 2,428 rows. So the DAX distinct function returns a one column table populated with distinct values. Go ahead and save your desktop file. Our next lesson will be about creating calculated columns. Like calculated tables, calculated columns become part of your data set. We're going to use the date diff function to calculate the difference in days between the order date and the ship date in the orders table. And we're going to name the column days to ship. So to get started, what I'm going to do, we can do this from the ribbon or we can do it by right clicking in the fields pane. So what we're going to want to do is I'm going to right click on the orders table in the fields pane and I'm going to select new column. The same effect happens when we did a new table where you in your formula bar, you get one column equal and in your fields pane, you have a column called column in this moment. Well, we're going to name it days to ship. So in the formula bar, I'm going to double click the word column and I'm going to type days to ship and then I'm going to navigate to after the equal sign. We're using the date diff function. So I'm going to start typing DA. And when I see it on the list, I stop typing. Again, you want to avoid typos wherever possible. In this case, I'm going to use my down arrow to highlight date diff in the list. And I'm going to use my tab key to tab it in. Again, just like with the calculated table, right underneath the formula bar, you're seeing the syntax of the date diff function. The first argument would be date one, the second one would be date two, and the third would be interval. It's waiting for the date one argument right now, which is why that's in bold. So I'm gonna start typing orders for the name of the table and I'm going to arrow down in the list until order date is highlighted and I'm going to tab it in. And we want the entire date. So a subsequent menu comes up, date is already selected and I'm going to tab that in. Now we're going to use a comma, which separates the arguments. You'll notice now that date two is in bold as that's the argument it's looking for. We want the orders ship date for that second date. So I'm going to start typing orders again, and I'm going to just down arrow until ship date is highlighted and tab it in. And again, we want it to assess the full date. So I'm going to tab in date and I'm going to type a comma. The interval we want the difference in dates in is days. So day is already highlighted. I'm going to tab that in and I'm going to press enter. You'll see your screen flicker while it's doing the calculation. And now if you look all the way to your right, the last column in the orders table is days to ship in the interval of days. Go ahead and save your desktop file. We created the days to ship column by right clicking on the orders table and choosing new column. Since we're in the days to ship column, we have the column tools tab on our ribbon. And that is another way that we can create another calculated column. We're going to create a calculated column that shows a ranking by sales. So the highest sales values will have the rank of number one 
and the lowest ones will have the rank of a higher number depending on how many sales values are in the orders table. We're going to be using the rank X function to do this and it has several variations. We're going to go through three of them. On the column tools tab of the ribbon, the last icon is new column. Make sure you're anywhere within the orders table in the fields pane and then click the new column button. It's going to do the same thing as when we right clicked on orders and chose new column. In the formula bar, we're going to go ahead and rename the column. So I'm going to double click the word column and I'm going to call it sales ranking highest sales ranking highest. And then I'm going to get myself after the equal sign. And the function we're using is rank X. So if you start typing it, R A N, you will see it on the list and you can double click it or highlight it and tab it in. So notice this particular function has five possible arguments. Whenever you're looking at the syntax, uh, arguments that are optional will be in square brackets. So there are two required arguments and three optional ones. For this example, we'll be using the two required arguments, table and expression. For the table argument, we're going to reference the orders table. So it has a separate table argument. So I'm going to just start typing the letter O and the orders table by itself shows up on the list and I'm going to tab that in. Now I'm going to do a comma so I can get to the expression argument. What we're assessing here is we want a ranking of the sales field in the orders table. So I'm going to start typing orders again, and then it'll show me the table as well as all the fields in the table. And I'm going to highlight orders sales and tab that in. We're ignoring the three optional arguments right now. And we can just press enter here so it performs this calculation in the newest column, which is all the way over to your right. Remember, the highest ranking sales would be numbered starting with one. The lowest sales values would be higher numbers at this point. Go ahead and save your desktop file. We're going to edit the rank X function we just did because we want to rename it sales ranking lowest. And we're going to use another argument so that the lowest sales values have the lower ranking starting with one and the highest sales values have the higher ranking numbers. We're going to do our edits in the formula bar. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to double click the word highest and change it to lowest. And inside the parentheses, I'm going to click after order sales after the closing square bracket and in between the parentheses. And I'm going to type a comma there and the syntax will show up again. When we type the comma, it's waiting now for the optional value argument and we want to skip that argument. So we're going to type another comma and it will advance to the order argument. We have ascending and descending. It's defaulting to descending, which is why we're getting the lowest sales having the higher numbers and the higher sales having the lower ranking numbers. We're going to switch the order to ascending. So ASC is already highlighted. I'm going to tab it in and I'm going to press enter. And you'll see that the sales ranking lowest column, it's now doing the opposite. The lower sales values are having the lower number rankings and the higher sales values are having higher number rankings. Let's talk about how rank X handles ties. So imagine we had two sales values of, I'll just say $1 each. 
Because we have it in ascending order now, if those were the lowest sales values, they would each be ranked number one. And then it would skip the next number. Since you have two at number one, you wouldn't have anything ranked number two. It would move to the next number, which would be three, unless you tell it otherwise. And that's the last optional argument. So in order to demonstrate this, I'm going to go ahead and open the Excel sample Superstore file so we can make a change in there. We're going to change one value in this Excel file to force a tie in sales values. I'm going to use the name box up here in the upper left corner, and I'm going to just go into the name box and I'm going to type W369 and press enter and it will take me to that cell. So cell W369 is selected, and I wanna change that value in that cell to 5297, mimicking the value above it. So I'm gonna just type 52.97, press enter, and I'm gonna go ahead and save and close this Excel file. To get that change to show in desktop, I'm going to have to refresh and that's on the home tab of the ribbon in the queries group. Go ahead and click the refresh button. So it will bring in the changes we just made in the source data file. Now let's take a look at the order IDs that we have the tied sales values in. So I'm going to go to the order ID auto filter drop down, And in the search box, you're going to type 8853. And you'll see several orders come up, order IDs with those numbers in it. What we want to do is we want to uncheck select all. And you're going to check 88538 and 88539 and press OK. You'll see that both of these orders have the same sales value and the ranking is the same, 546. We're gonna clear our filter from order ID now by going to the funnel and selecting clear filter so we get our full list back and go to your sales ranking lowest auto filter. And when you get in there, go into the search box and type 547. So that would be the next ranking. We had two at 546, right? And you'll see there is no ranking 547 because it's going to skip that number. If we had three at the same value, they would all be five, four, six, and then it would skip two numbers. Change your search to five, four, eight, and you'll see that that ranking is in the list. And you can just cancel the auto filter box. Skipping is the default with the rank X function. So again, when you have sales values that are the same and they tie and their number in the ranking is like 546 and there's two of them at that number, it's going to skip 547 unless you tell it not to do so by using the optional last argument. So we're going to modify this rank X function again. Um, we're going to first go up to the formula bar and we're going to change it after the word Lois. Put no skip, so we'll know this is the one that's not going to skip any numbers. And after that, you're going to click after ASC and inside the closing paren and type a comma. So you can see that last optional argument is the ties argument. If you don't use this argument, it defaults to skip, and we've seen that behavior 
we're going to tell it to use the dense argument so it won't skip any numbers. So since it's already selected, I'm going to tab it in and I'm going to press enter. So it recalculates. Now keep in mind, since it's not skipping numbers, the rankings have changed. If you want to look up order IDs, 88538 and 88539, you'll see that they're still tied, but at a different number. The subsequent number, if you filter for sales ranking lowest, no skip will be the next number. It won't skip any numbers. Go ahead and check that out and then save your file. So far in this module, we use the distinct function to create a calculated table. It returned a table with one column of distinct values. Then we created a few calculated columns. We use date diff and the rank X function to create these columns. Both the table that we created and the columns that we created become part of your data set. Now we're going to switch gears and talk about measures. Measures could be called virtual calculations. They don't become part of your data set. They only calculate when you add them to a report visualization. So if file size is an issue, you may want to use measures instead of calculated columns or calculated tables. There are two variations of measures. There are quick measures, which are templates of sorts. And then there are measures which you build from scratch. We're going to get started using quick measures. We want to create a quick measure in the orders table that will give us the average sales based on customer segment. So you'll notice, you know, in the orders table, we have the sales field. We also have a customer segment field to create the quick measure in the fields pane. I'm going to right click on the orders table and I'm going to select new quick measure. The dialog box will open for quick measures. And on the left side, you have calculation and a drop down. And on the right side, you have your fields from all of your table instances, just like you do in other views where it says select a calculation on the left side, we're going to go ahead and do the drop down. You want to take a moment and look through. They have different headings in here, aggregate per category, filters, time intelligence, so on and so forth. The one that we want to use is we're looking for one under the total section and we're going to select total for category filters, not applied. That's the calculation we want to use. For the base value, we're going to expand the orders table on the right side, and we're going to just drag the sales field into the base value text box. And it says sum of sales, but we want the average of sales. So I'm going to go over to the ellipsis, the more options button, and instead of sum, which is the default, I'm going to click on average. And for category in the fields list, we're going to grab the customer segment field and drag it into the category box. So a quick measure allows you to make choices in this dialog and it will create the calculation for you. In the bottom right corner, go ahead and click OK. And again, it won't become part of your data set. So when you do a calculated column, it puts it at the end on the right of your data set. This is a virtual calculation. But if you look up at your formula bar, you'll see based on the selections in the quick measures dialog box, it built a nested calculation for you. It used the calculate function with a nested average and a nested all function. You'll see your measure in the field pane and notice the icon in front of it that represents that it is a measure. Now you won't be able to see this like in data view. You can only see it on a report visualization. We haven't gotten to visualizations yet, 
but let's go ahead and build a simple one so we can see the result of your measure. So on the left side, I'm going to go to report view, the first view button. In report view, just go to your fields pane and drag your average of sales total for customer segment measure directly into the center of your screen where it says build visuals with your data. Again, we'll be doing a deeper dive in reporting visualizations in a later module, but I just want you to see the results of your measure. Also in the fields pane, you're going to go ahead and grab the customer segment field and drag it to the axis box right in the visualizations pane. Drag it and drop it. We're going to do one other field for this. We're going to grab product category field and we're going to drag it to the small multiples box in the visualizations pane. And I'm going to just use the sizing handles on my visualization to make it wider. And you can see the average of sales total for customer segment and broken out by product category. So if I hover over the first column under furniture, you'll see the tool tip. It tells me the average of sales 213907 for technology. When I hover over it, you'll see the tool tip updates, so on and so forth. So it didn't calculate that quick measure until we added it to a visualization. And with your visualization still selected, and you can see the sizing handles around it, just go ahead and press delete on your keyboard to get rid of it and save your desktop file. Now we're gonna create a measure from scratch to calculate the average sales per product category for the orders table. So I'm going to just right click on orders again in the fields pane. This time I'm going to do new measure instead of new quick measure. And it just brings up the formula bar. So we're going to name this measure average sales per product category. Remember, whatever is before the equal sign is the name of the item. So average sales per product category and navigate to after the equal sign so we can use the functions that we're going to use. We're going to start with the calculate function. So start typing it in. And by the way, when it's highlighted on the list to the right of the highlight, it tells you what the function does. So this evaluates an expression in a context modified by filters. So, we're going to go ahead and tab in calculate. The first argument is expression. We want to calculate the average of orders sales field. So for the expression argument, we're going to use the average function. Start typing average. And when you see it, you're going to go ahead and tab it in just plain average. And we want the average of the sales field in the orders table. So I'm going to start typing orders and I'm going to just do my down arrow until orders sales field is selected and I'm going to tab it in. Now we want to get back to the calculate function at this point. So after order sales, we're going to go ahead and type a closing paren and it takes us back to calculate. We're still in its expression argument. And now we want to advance to the filter argument, which is optional. So we're going to type a comma and it takes us to that filter one argument. For the filter one argument, we're going to use another function, the all selected function. So I'm going to start typing all when I see it on the list, I'm going to highlight it. So it tells you that all selected returns all the rows in a table or all the values in a column, ignoring any filters that might have been implied inside the query, but keeping filters that come from outside. Let's talk about what that means for a moment. In a later module, when we do a deep dive into reporting visualizations, 
you'll learn how to use the filters pane in report view to apply filters for your visualization. That would be considered filters applied inside the query. A filter that comes from outside the query would be, for example, the slicer visual visualization, which would be a separate visualization. So it would be considered outside of the query. A slicer is a way of visually filtering. So when you're using all selected, it would ignore any filters inside the query, for example, like on this filters pane, but it would keep filters that you can control from outside the query. In our case, it's going to return all of the product categories. We don't have any filters, so it's going to return all of them. So I'm going to go ahead and tab in all selected. And I'm going to go to the orders table. So start typing orders and we want the product category field this time from the orders table. And I'm going to get that in. We're going to need to type two closing parentheses at the end of this and press enter. So when you do that, it sets up the measure for you. It shows in your field pane. And again, it will only show on a reporting visualization as it is not part of your data set. Save your sample Superstore file. The final lesson in this module is using time intelligence functions and key performance indicators. We're going to get started with time intelligence functions. In order to use these types of functions in Power BI, you have to have what is known as a date table in your data model. We don't have a date table in our data model, so we will create one. There are two different DAX functions that you can use to do this, one of which is named calendar. For the calendar function to work, you have to provide it with a start and an end date, and it will build a table for you with one column with all of those dates. Calendar auto is the second function, and that one can scan your data and determine the earliest date and the latest date in your data model. We're going to use calendar auto it will return one column with all of the dates in the data model. After we create that table, we're going to amend it by adding other columns. So let's get started. In your fields pane, make sure the orders table is selected. And then on the table tools tab of the ribbon, you're going to click new table. In the formula bar, we're going to double click on the word table and we're going to name it dates and navigate to after the equal sign. We're going to use calendar auto. So I'm going to start typing CA when it shows up on the list. And you'll see that it says it returns a table with one column of dates calculated from the model automatically. I'm going to go ahead and tab it in and we are just going to do a closing parenthesis at the end and press enter. So if you look over in your fields pane, you'll see the dates table. When you expand it, it has one column called date. And you can take a look at the dates. If you go over to your left, go to data view and you'll see that it has a date range starting from January 1st. 2010 and it goes all the way through 12 31 2014 so our earliest date and the latest date in our data model and every date in between is in one column in this new table in addition to having the full date column we would like in this table to have the year of each date in a separate column as well as the quarter and the month in two different ways. So we are going to nest our calendar auto function within an add columns function. 
And to do that, you're going to click after the equal sign right before calendar auto in the formula bar. And you're going to type, start typing add and add columns function comes up. It does exactly what it sounds like. It's going to add more columns to this table. I'm going to go ahead and tab it in. Now we're going to click after the closing parenthesis after calendar auto, and we're going to type a comma. So this is now part of the add column syntax. It wants the name of the column that we're adding. We're going to have to put it in double quotes because it's text. So in double quotes, I'm going to type year and close the quotes and type a comma. And I'm going to use the year function to extract the year of the date. So I'm going to start typing year. It shows up on the list. I'm going to tab it in. And what you're going to do is you're going to just in square brackets, you're going to type date. Well, when you type the square brackets, you'll see date show up on the list. So I'm going to select it from the list instead of typing it. So to extract the year of the date, now I'm going to do a closing paren to close out the year function, and I'm going to type a comma. Now I don't want this to be one long run on function, so I'm going to press shift enter to get down to the next row to continue this function. The next thing we would like to extract is the quarter. So we want another column in double quotes. We're going to name it quarter, comma, and we want the letter Q before the quarter number. So in double quotes, we're going to type the capital letter Q. We're going to use the ampersand for concatenation, meaning combine the Q with the quarter number. And we're going to use the quarter function. So go ahead and start typing it and get it in on that bracketed date field. So I typed the square bracket and it popped up on the list. We need a closing parenthesis, another comma, and you're going to shift enter again to get down to the next line. We want to extract the month of the date in two different ways. We want the short name of the month or the full name of the month actually. And we want the month number in two separate columns. So we're going to name another column month and that's going to be in double quotes, comma, and we're going to tell it how to format the date. So we're going to use the format function and you can get that in there. And we're doing it on the date field. So I type the square bracket and I'm grabbing it from the list. We're going to do a comma and now we're going to tell it what format. So in double quotes, I'm going to type four lowercase m's to indicate, give me the full name of the month. If we did three m's, it would be an abbreviation of the month. We're going to close the double quotes, closing paren, one more comma, and shift enter. We also want to extract the month number. So we want to have a column called month number. We're going to do that in double quotes, comma. We're going to use the month function here. The month function extracts the number of the month. And we're going to do it on that bracketed date field, which is the only field in this table so far. We're going to do a closing paren. And I'm going to do shift enter one more time and type one more closing paren. Now when you press enter, the dates table will update and it will show the additional columns that we added. 
So calendar auto only returns one column, the date column. We use the add columns function to add more columns to this table. Go ahead and save your file. Once you have your date table created, you need to mark it as a date table so Power BI will know which table to reference when you're using time intelligence functions. We're going to, in the fields pane, we're going to right click on our dates table. And off of the shortcut menu, you'll see mark as date table, hover over that, and then click on mark as date table. The dialog box opens and it needs you to just select the column. In this case, the column to be used for the date. In our new dates table, we only have one column and that is the date column that it automatically created, the column that holds the full date. So that's the only one that's gonna show up on the list here. It tells you it was validated successfully and you can click OK. So we've just created a date table, added more columns to it, and marked it as a date table. The last thing we need to do is we need to relate the date table to our orders table. Let's go to model view on the left side, the last view button, and we're going to do it based on the order date field in the orders table. So I'm going to click and hold on the order date field and drag it and drop it on top of the date field in the dates table and let it create that one to many or many to one relationship. Many order dates can be in the dates table is what's that, what that is saying. Go ahead and save your file. Now that we have our dates table related to our orders table, let's go back to data view and we're going to scroll to the right. Since we did that relationship, you'll notice that our days to ship calculated column is filled with arrows. Because we're telling the orders table to look at the dates table, it's not recognizing the dot date portion of the order date or ship date fields anymore. So in order to resolve that, we're going to get rid of them in the formula bar. So in your date diff function after orders order date, you're going to delete the dot date that's in brackets after that. So we want orders order date and then just a comma, and we're going to do the same for order ship date. We're going to get rid of the dot date after it, the qualifier, and we're going to press enter after we do that, and it will recalculate. Now, sometimes it'll try to put the dot date back in there. If it does that, just go back and delete it again and press enter, and it will update. So now you have your days to ship. The reason that happened is we did that calculation between dates before we created a dates table and related it to the orders table. So now it's looking at the dates table for information. We're going to add two more calculated columns to our data set. For the orders table, we want one to show the end of the month for each order and another to show the end of the quarter for each order. Go ahead and right click your orders table in the field pane and choose new column. And we're going to name this column in the formula bar. You're going to name the column end of month. and position yourself after the equal sign. Well, one of the time intelligence functions in Power BI is end of month. So start typing end of month when you see it on the list, you can tab it in. And it wants to know the end of the month for what date. 
So it's the orders order date. So I'm going to start typing orders and then I'll see the table as well as all of its fields. And I'm going to just go down until I have orders order date highlighted and tab that in. You can go ahead and press enter and you'll see the end of month column populates and it has the last day of each month for each order that's listed in the orders table. We're going to do another new column in the orders table and this one is going to be for the end of quarter. So I'm going to right click on orders again, choose new column. I'm going to name the column end of quarter and get after the equal sign. And there is an end of quarter function, which I'm going to use on the same orders order date column. And press enter. So we just increased our data set by adding two more calculated columns, end of month and end of quarter. Let's go ahead and format these two columns so they match the order and ship date column formats. I'm going to click in the end of month column and on the column tools tab of the ribbon, I'm going to access the format drop down and select the date format that says March 14, 2001. Do the same for the end of quarter column. We're going to use a different desktop file for our final topic in this module. So go ahead and save and close your sample Superstore desktop file. Open the retail analysis sample desktop file that you grabbed from the video description. And we're going to use this file for key performance indicator visualization. This file has more detail than the sample superstore file. On the left side, let's go ahead and go to data view. And if necessary, expand the sales table in the fields pane. We have comparative columns in this data two of which are of interest to us for our key performance indicator. There's a calculated column called total units last year, and there's one called total units this year. That gives us the ability to compare our progress. I'm going to collapse the sales table and expand the timetable. The timetable has a fiscal month column. And we're going to use that to be able to see a comparison between last year, this year by fiscal month. A key performance indicator commonly known as a KPI is a critical or key indicator of progress toward an intended result. It's a visualization type in power BI. Let's go to report view. Again, that's the first view button on the left hand side. And when you get to report view, do the plus sign at the bottom of the screen to create a new page. When we get to module seven, we'll do a far deeper dive into reporting visualizations. But for right now, we're going to use the fields that we looked at to start creating our KPI. Now, before you create the KPI, you actually start building the report without the framework of a KPI. The reason why is once you convert the report that you build into a KPI, you won't be able to have sorting capabilities. So this is how it works. In the fields pane, we're going to expand the sales table. And we're going to grab the total units this year calculated column and drag it right into the center of your screen onto the canvas. 
Now we're going to expand the timetable in the fields pane, and we're going to drag the fiscal month field into the highlighted box on the canvas. At this point, this is not a KPI visualization. It's a clustered column chart. Let's expand the chart so it's a little bit wider. We can use the sizing handles. And if you want to move it, you can click in a blank area and you can move it around on the canvas. This is the point where you would want to perform a sort before you turn it into a KPI visualization. We'd like to sort this in ascending order by fiscal month. So in the upper right hand corner of the visualization, you'll have the more options vertical ellipsis icon. And we're going to click that and hover over sort by at the bottom. You're going to click on fiscal month and you'll see that it sorted it by fiscal month. If we go back to the ellipsis, you can see that it sorted it in descending order and we're going to want to click on sort ascending. Now we have it sorted in ascending order. Go ahead and save your retail analysis sample file. And with your visualization still selected, you can tell it's selected by the sizing handles around it. We're going to convert it to the KPI visualization. In the visualizations pane, you want to find the KPI visualization. It looks like it has a green triangle and a red triangle on it kind of looks like a table and I'm going to point to it now on my screen. When you find that visualization, go ahead and click on it. And it converted our column chart into a KPI visualization. When you look in the visualizations pane now, You'll see that it put total units this year as the indicator. It has fiscal month as the trend access. And now we just need to add a field for target goals. So we're comparing total units this year to total units last year. In the fields pane, I'm going to grab total units last year and drag it into the target goals box. And now you'll see our KPI visualization is complete. In terms of the comparison in the visualization, the shaded area in the back is your goal area. It tells you the value and then it tells you the goal. And along with the goal, it gives the percentage difference. In this case, we're negative, and so it also indicates a negative response with the exclamation point to the right of the value. The last thing we're going to do here is rename this page, page one. We're going to double click on it, and we're going to name it KPI. Press enter so it will accept the page name change and go ahead and save your retail analysis sample file. In this module, we explored the world of DAX, data analysis expressions. We learned that it's the formula language used in Power BI. We use DAX for simple formulas and expressions, and we created calculated columns and tables based off of DAX functions. We also created quick measures and measures, both virtual calculations. We worked with time intelligence functions after creating a dates table. And you learned how to create a key performance indicator visualization. In the Word document that's in the video description, it's called Website Links and More Information, there are links to more information about DAX functions from various sites. Module 6 is optimizing model performance. 
You'll be introduced to steps, processes, concepts, and data modeling best practices necessary to optimize a data model for enterprise level performance. We'll be using the retail analysis sample desktop file from the previous module and the sample superstore desktop file we created in module two. In this module, we'll use the direct query method to access a data source. We'll understand the importance of variables and how to use them in DAX functions. And we'll cover some other optimization techniques. So far, we've imported data into Power BI. When doing so, we've loaded all the data from the data source or a large subset of the data from this data source into Power BI Desktop. In some cases, this creates a large file size and causes some performance issues. When you refresh in Power BI Desktop, it literally reloads all the data back into the data model. Depending on the size of the model, this could be a lengthy process that you perform multiple times a day. If file size is a consideration and the source data is very large and or data is changing frequently and reports must reflect the latest data, you would use direct query. Direct query connects directly to data in the original source repository. For example, SQL Server or Azure Analysis Services. And no data is actually imported into Power BI. When visualizations are created, queries are sent to the underlying data source to retrieve necessary data. Upon refresh, the necessary queries are resent for each visual for updating. When publishing reports to the service, you will see a data set as well as the reports. However, no data is included in the data set. The data resides in the source repository. There's additional detailed information in the Word document, website links, and additional info in the video description. It'll let you know all of the data sources that you can use direct query on. We're going to get started by using the retail analysis sample desktop file where we created our KPI in the previous module. One of the data sources that you can use direct query on is a Power BI data set. In order to use a Power BI data set for a direct query, that data set needs to be published to the service. So we're going to go ahead and publish this data set to the service. We did this in a previous module, and again, in a later module, we'll spend more time examining the service when we set up our dashboards. But in the meantime, the last button on the Home tab of the ribbon is Publish. Go ahead and click on it to start the process. So we all have in common a workspace named My Workspace. If you don't have any other workspaces available to you, you can use that one. I am going to use my Power BI video workspace by selecting it on the list. It may take a few moments to publish this as this is a fairly large data set. When it's done publishing, you'll get the success check mark and you can get to the service by clicking the link that says open retail analysis sample.pbix in Power BI. Go ahead and click the link. It opens the report, which is all of the pages that are in our report view in the desktop. Because I was on the KPI page, that's the page that it's on here in the service. We want to navigate to the workspace where we sent this data. So on the left side of your screen, almost toward the bottom, you're going to hover over the workspaces icon and select it. I'm going to click on my Power BI video workspace and you'll notice that it put the report, which is what we were just looking at, as well as the data set, the underlying data in the service. Because the data set is now in the service, we'll be able to use direct query in a new instance of Power BI desktop. I've switched back over to the desktop and I'm going to click on Got It 
on the Publishing the Power BI screen. We want to access direct query from a new Power BI file. So we're going to go up to the File tab of the ribbon and select New on the left-hand side to start a new instance of Desktop. When it opens, go ahead and close the splash screen. Before we access our Power BI dataset that we published, I just want you to know that the data sources that are supported with direct query, depending on which one you choose, you're going to have to do something different, maybe. So for example, SQL Server is a data source that's supported by direct query. On the Home tab of the ribbon in the Data Group, go ahead and click on SQL Server, and you'll notice that it has a Data Connectivity Mode section. It defaults to Import, so if you want to use Direct Query to connect to SQL Server data, you would have to use the Option button for Direct Query. We're going to go ahead and cancel that dialog. When you're bringing in from a Power BI data set, it automatically is in direct query mode, so you won't have to make a choice like you would have for SQL Server. So on the Home tab of the ribbon, we're going to go ahead and click on Power BI Datasets, and it's only going to show you the datasets that are published to the service. We're going to click on Retail Analysis Sample, and then the Create button in the lower right corner. Before we do anything else, let's save this file, and we're going to name it Direct Query. Right now, there doesn't appear to be a difference between using Import or Direct Query to bring data into the desktop. On the right side, you still have your fields pane. If you expand the sales table, you'll see all of the fields. But what I want you to notice is on the left-hand side. On the left side, you no longer have data view. You just have your report view, which is default, and you have modeling view. There is no data view because it didn't actually bring in any data from the underlying source. If you go to Modeling View, you'll be able to see the fields in the tables and the relationships that have been created in this data. I'm going to go back to Report View, and we're going to recreate the KPI report that we did in the previous module. So we're going to expand the Sales table in the Fields pane and we're going to grab the total units this year field and drag it onto the canvas. And then we're going to expand the time table and we're going to drag fiscal month into the framework on the canvas as well. Next, we're going to access more options in the upper right hand corner of the visualization and we're going to hover over Sort By, and we're going to click on Fiscal Month. We're going to go back to More Options and click on Sort Ascending. So remember, you have to sort before you turn it into a KPI because the KPI doesn't allow sorting. I've resized the column chart a little bit, and now in the Visualizations pane, I'm going to go to the KPI visualization and convert this into a KPI. So when we did that, it actually sent a question to the underlying data source to retrieve the information for this visualization. Go ahead and save and close your direct query file and also close your retail sales analysis sample desktop file. Navigate to your working directory where you have saved your direct query desktop file and the retail sample analysis file and look at the difference in file size. Retail sample analysis is over 9,000 kilobytes. 
has a lot of data that we imported into Power BI Desktop. Direct Query, however, didn't bring any data in, and so therefore that file is only 7 kilobytes. If file size is a consideration and your data source is supported by Direct Query, it's recommended that you use Direct Query. Our next lesson in this module is about variables. We're going to be using the sample Superstore desktop file if you want to pause the video and launch that file. So what are variables? Let's get some background information. You've already been exposed to DAX functions. We've nested functions. So you can see as a data modeler, writing and debugging some DAX calculations can be challenging. If you get an error in your formula or function, you have to debug it. It's common that complex calculation requirements often involve writing compound or complex expressions as you've already experienced. Compound expressions can involve the use of many nested functions and possibly the reuse of expression logic. Using variables in your DAX formulas helps you write complex and efficient calculations. So that's the why you would want to use a variable. What is a variable? You can store the result of an expression as a named variable, which can then be passed as an argument to other measure expressions. Once resultant values have been calculated for a variable expression, those values do not change even if the variable is referenced in another expression. And we're going to focus on variables and how to use them in our calculations in this lesson. So what can variables do for you? Why are they important? They can improve performance. They can improve the readability of your functions and expressions. They can simplify fixing them if they're broken, also known as debugging, and they can reduce the complexity of a calculation. We're going to start by creating a basic measure to calculate the total sales from the orders table. So over to the right in the fields pane, I'm going to right click on orders and choose new measure. We're going to name the measure. So I'm double clicking the word measure in the title bar and I'm going to name it total sales and navigate to after the equal sign. And I'm using the calculate function with a nested sum X function here. So I'm going to start typing calculate and I'm going to tab it in from the list. And then I'm going to start typing sum and I'm going to highlight sum X and tab that in as well. So the first argument for sum X is the table. I'm going to start typing orders. And when I see the table on the list, I'm going to tab it in. I'm going to type the comma to separate arguments and the expression is going to be on the orders sales field. So I'm going to start typing orders again and I'm going to just down arrow until orders sales is highlighted and I'm going to tab that in and I'm going to press enter. At this point, if there was an error, you would have red highlight up here and it would be letting you know. And again, with a measure, it won't show until you use it on a visualization. But if you look in your fields list, you'll see the total sales measure. We created that measure so we can use it in another measure that we're going to create where we're going to also use a variable. Now we're going to create another measure in the orders table that includes variables. So I'm going to right click on orders again and select new measure. In the formula bar, I'm going to name this one 2010 total corporate sales, 2010 total corporate sales. And I'm going to position myself after the equal sign. 
We're going to go ahead and press shift enter so we get another line. This is going to be a multi line function. So you don't ever want to be in a position where you have to read a long line from left to right, especially when you're troubleshooting. And we're going to use the var keyword to start our variable declaration. That's where you name it and tell it what it's going to contain. So I'm going to type var. Var is a keyword. It will not show up on the function list. They have variance functions that show up on the list. We just want var plain. So we're going to do shift enter afterwards to come down to the next line. We're going to name this variable corporate sales. I'm going to type capital C corporate, no space in between capital S sales and an equal sign. So this is where we use a nested function. What we want is we want all of the corporate sales right now from the orders table. The type of sale is in the customer segment. So we're going to use the filter function. Go ahead and grab that with a nested all function. Grab the all function. And we're going to refer to the orders table customer segment field. So when I start typing orders and I see orders customer segment on the list, I'm going to highlight it and tab it in. And we're going to do a closing parenthesis. So that orders customer segment is the table name or column name for the all function. We're going to do a closing parenthesis to return to the filter function. And we're going to type a comma to get to the filter expression argument. So this is where we're going to tell it to filter only for corporate customer segment. So we're going to reference orders customer segment field again. And we're going to type an equal sign and in double quotes corporate because it's a text field. It has to be in double quotes. And we're going to do a closing parenthesis. Shift enter to come down to line four. So right now we declared a variable called corporate sales, where it's going to only bring us from the orders table, all of the sales for the customer segment known as corporate. Now we want to declare another variable in this variable. We'll tell it to only use 2010 dates. So we're going to do our var keyword again and shift enter. We're going to name this variable capital I included capital D dates. And we need an equal sign afterwards. We'll go ahead and go down to the next row. So I'm shift entering again. And this is going to be another filter all. So I'm going to start using the filter function and then I'm going to bring in the all function. This time we're using our dates table year field. So I see it on the list. I'm going to grab it dates year. And I'm going to do a closing paren to come out of the all function, a comma to advance to the filter expression argument for the filter function. And we're going to reference the dates year field again. And this time we're going to type equal 2010 and a closing parenthesis shift enter. So, so far we've declared two variables and told it what the variables will contain. And now the other part of declaring a variable is telling it what to return. So what do we want our end result to be? We're going to use the keyword return and shift enter. And we're going to use the calculate function here. And we want to calculate the total sales measure that we created earlier. So since it's a measure, it will show up. If you type an open square bracket, you'll see your measures that are in the orders table. And we're going to grab total sales measure. We're going to type a comma shift enter 
And now we're going to call those two variables. So we're saying calculate total sales, but we only want them for the customer segment corporate and we only want them for 2010. So all we have to do is type the name of the variable. So corporate sales is the first one. Notice the icon in front of it in the list. That's the X, Y icon indicates it is a variable, a named variable. I'm going to tab it in, type a comma and shift enter. And I'm going to start typing included dates, which is our second variable. And I'm going to grab that and get it in there and a closing paren. Now at this point, the return is what's really happening here. It's going to calculate total sales, but it's going to be filtered for the corporate customer segment and for the year 2010 order dates. So when you do something like this or in any DAX calculation, really, you might want to get in the habit of putting comments in that explain what the calculation is doing. If the file is being shared with other people, they'll be able to see your comments. And even you, your future self, like six months down the line, you might look at this and say, what did I do? Comments will be helpful then as well. So we're going to do shift enter one more time, and we're going to type two forward slashes. Notice those slashes turn green. That indicates that what comes afterwards is a comment. When this calculation happens in this measure, when we add it to a visual, it won't try to calculate comment lines. So we're going to type this calculation is only for 2010 corporate sales. If you wanted to be more detailed, you'd explain the variables here and what they're representing. We're going to go ahead and press enter and we shouldn't get any error messages for this. And in your fields pane, you'll see that 2010 total corporate sales measure. The variables we declared in the 2010 total corporate sales measure are only available in that measure. They're scoped to that measure. If we wanted to, to create a similar thing, but for 2011 total corporate sales, we would have to recreate the variables. Instead of doing that, it's more efficient to just copy the function for 2010 corporate sales. So I'm going to go up to the formula bar and just select everything, including the comments. And I'm going to do control C to put it on the clipboard. I'm going to right click on the orders table again in the fields pane and select new measure. And I'm going to use control V as in Victor to paste it. Now I just have to update it. So I'm going to start with the name of it. I'm going to call it 2011 total corporate sales. The corporate sales variable is fine. The included dates variable needs to be updated to 2011. And the comment should be updated as well. And then I'm going to press enter. So now I have two measures, one for 2010, one for 2011. I'd also like the same thing for 2012 and 2013. So I'm going to give you the opportunity to create those on your own. When you're done, you should have all four of those total corporate sales measures in your fields pane. And now we're going to use a multi card visual to see all of the numbers. So you're still in report view. And what you're going to do is you're going to go to your visualizations pane and you're going to look for the multi row card visualization and click it. And I'm going to just expand the width of the visualization. And then in the fields pane, I'm going to click and hold on 2010 total corporate sales and drag it into the card visualization. Do the same with 2011, 2012, 2013, 
And now you have a card showing the differences in sales for that corporate customer segment over the four years. Go ahead and save your file. The last lesson in this module is other optimization techniques. So in the next module, we'll start getting into Power BI reports and we'll go over these optimization techniques specifically geared toward your visualizations when we get into the next module. But for right now, one of the things you can do to optimize your reports is apply the most restrictive filters to them instead of having one visualization trying to show everything, you might want to break them down by filtering. You also want to limit the amount of visuals on any one report page. I know that everybody's into grouping them together and that's fine unless it becomes a performance issue for you. And there are custom visuals that you can gain access to and you want to evaluate how they perform. If they're not performing well, then you probably don't want to use them. When it comes to optimizing the environment, the three things listed on the slide are things that typically the IT department will be involved with. There is more detailed information about capacity settings, gateway sizing, and network latency in the Word document, website links, and additional information in the video description. So to recap this module, we started by using direct query for enhanced performance. Up until then, we had been importing the data directly into Power BI, which creates a large file size if you have a huge data set. And when we use direct query, it directly connects to the data when it needs to build report visualizations instead of actually storing the data in a data model. And you saw the file size comparison. We use variables in DAX functions to reduce complexity. So the result of the expression is stored in the variable upon declaration. It doesn't have to be recalculated each time it is used as it would without using a variable. So that could be another performance issue that's avoided if you're using variables. We reviewed a few other optimization techniques. And again, there's more detailed information about all of the lessons in the website links and additional info word document in the video description. Thanks for watching. Don't forget we also offer live classes in office applications, professional development, and private training. Visit learnit.com for more details. Please remember to like and subscribe and let us know your thoughts in the comments. Thank you for choosing Learnit.